two, one, two, three, four. I've been shot a couple of times, stabbed a few times. But that's because you put yourself in danger. It's because I prefer the company of lunatics. I prefer the company of people who live on the edge rather than the straight life. It's not for me. I don't like it. Uh, anything I've copped, I've more or less deserved it. Seriously. So what have you done to your leg? I don't know what have they done to my leg. Um, I had, uh, I think, what a baker's cyst, which is a quite common thing, apparently. It's a build-up of the synovial fluid, what is what keeps your joints from sticking together at the edges. From years of standing on one leg, basically, playing 15 or 20 kilos of um, Les Paul guitar. And I kept so sort of staggering to the right. I thought, this can't be right. And one day it went, bink. Half the toes are going by me and half the toes are turning around thing on the other side. So off she goes. Hey, peg leg Martin. Woman, you bet. Well, he's overdone it, you see, because most men would be dead, you know, having done what John's done. Some people say he's self-indulgent. Some people say that he is willfully destructive. Others would go so far as to say that he is a death wish. Drag away. I chose the vehicle and I chose the road, so it doesn't really... There ain't nobody else's fault but mine. <laughs> nobody's fault but mine. Nobody's fault but mine. Nobody's fault but mine. Fire in my soul, oh Lord. Nobody's fault but mine. Well, I think I first saw John at the Cousins, Les Cousins, as we used to call it, um, in Greek Street in the 60s, actually. Fire in my soul, oh Lord. We were all very guitar orientated in those days. John had this really fast, blinding, dazzling technique at a very young age. It was about I guess he must have been about 18. I heard, um, <laughs> you're not going to believe this, Joan Baez, believe it or not, the first I'd heard um, finger picking on guitar ever. And uh, she was playing a song called a Silver Dagger, which was actually a minor hit in Great Britain. Um, and I loved that sound. I thought, wow. And a school friend of mine, his father was. Um, a bit of a raver, and he had a David Graham album. When I had that, I was done. Phew, I want to be that person. I want to do that. My parents were both nutters in their own way. They sang light opera. My parents were divorced very early. I think I was about two, I'm not really sure about eight. Um, and I lived, brought up with my grandmother and my father in Glasgow. Lived on a houseboat when I was young. I remember being rather well, sad at the lack of my mother some, from time to time, but I mean, only very rarely. My, uh, my youth was really cool, I liked it. Swans in the sun. Oh, such fun. No scars, or well, none visible, anyway. Then one day a man was seen chugging along on his river. You know, by the time I got to running away age, I was really interested in making music, and I couldn't survive. Of what I would get money wise in Scotland. Just couldn't do it. I was eating a at that point. I became John Martin down to a guy called uh, Sandy Glennon, who was my first agent. The folk club scene was David Graham, who's the granddaddy of all of us, Birchance, John Renborn, and then the, the, they became a duo. And, of course, everyone moves to London. I, I went there primarily to make money and escape um, having to work in any way or fashion. To live the life of a bohemian. The Cousins, as we called it, was actually supposed to be Les Cousins. And, I mean, for years I thought it was own blow blow called Les Cousins, you know. There was a real buzz. Everybody knew, everyone knew everybody else. Bob Dylan played there, Spider John Kerner played there, John Byers played there. And those days, these people weren't famous. And they'd all do three sets. And in between, they'd have 
the cannon fodder like me. It was wonderful. Going to a John Martin gig in 1967-68 was, was much more like a, 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 a happening from that time. I remember, I remember John uh, being in Cousins uh, in the club, sort of playing in this little cellar. He was on stage playing and the phone rang in the, in the corridor. And he just reached out and picked up something, hello, you know, and, and just carried on this conversation about, you know, with the audience in front of him. And, th you know, things like that are very spontaneous. John came in like the young kid. He just brought this kind of boyishness, couldn't give a tuppenny toss, uh, played a cheap guitar and made it sound like a, you know, the most expensive instrument you could you play. Full of vim and vigour and life. In a foreign city once again you He was the first white artist uh, I ever signed. And um, his music was a million miles different from what I was doing in general, because at that time I wasn't even doing anything much in rock and roll or anything. In fact, I was doing nothing in rock and roll. I was just in, in Jamaican music. Um, but I, I liked him and I loved his voice and his playing, so I was signed up. I say London was, was a mecca, you know, for so London conversation, even the word London. You know, swinging London. It was, it was in those days, you know, and it was a big thing. London was like, everyone in Scotland bought it because it had London. <laughs> He's gone down south and made it, man. He's got an album. Look at that, pal. Look at that. I, mean, I know him. I went to school with him. As the mares keep tumbling down. Certainly those first two records. They hadn't been massive, but they hadn't cost a lot. My sort of influences are jazz labels, you know, Blue Note records. and So it's more important to work with an artist's career, and the records are like milestones in the career. He was, a, to me, a musician, more than a, you know, more than somebody who was there wanting to be a star. I think that one of the things uh, also about that time of the Tumblr was that even at that time there were kind of, you know, uh, branches out to other fields and particularly to jazz. Harold McNair was playing on the Tumblr and he was just the most amazing jazz flute player. Uh, yeah, sure, the, the, the work of a uh, very innocent young fella learning his thing, you know. I was just getting started in those days. I don't actually know the name of the album. I don't know what the fuck to I mean. Uh, another one out the way. Um, <laughs> well, cop this. I shagged Michael Tyson. Well, he would be working a lot more if it wasn't for his foot. That's held up everything, you know. He could be touring anywhere. She was doing a gig in uh, Chelsea, beside the fire station, some college or other anyway. And uh, I went up and did a guest spot. He was only 19. He was really a really beautiful man. Beautiful golden curls and big grin and six foot and nicely built. To treat a woman kind. We were introduced and uh, he sort of looked at me and apparently he said, oh, I saw big eyes, big tits and a big ooter and I thought, I'd love to fuck that, you know, basically. <laughs> yes! 
She said they were a wonderful pair of tits, so that's true. <laughs> yeah, she was lovely, she was a very beautiful girl. A very, physically a very beautiful girl. And mentally too, very gentle. Far too gentle for me, I'm afraid. Sweet honesty. It wasn't a boozer then, as far as I was concerned. In those days, it was, it was all, we were all smoking pot, you know, and like, <laughs> scrape me off the ceiling, man, you know. That was a major turning point in my life because I'd never played with a band before. Especially not a modern band, a modern ish, I mean. And uh, Yvonne Helm on drums and all those kind of people, and Harvey Brooks on bass, so it just taught me a great deal. It just taught me a great deal. And I felt really privileged, and it was like, phew, look at the way these people live, this is different. There's America too, living in Woodstock. Bound to turn the young boy's brain, isn't it? You know what I mean? Whoa, this is cool. Don't get wet, please keep dry. Think about the people who made you cry. It was going to be my album, and he was coming along for the ride. I'm John the Baptist, and this is my friend Salome. And you can bet it's my head she wants, and not my heart only. If you see he wasn't content to just be a guitar player playing with me. I started to, to write some songs and present them to Joe and say, I've got this song. And then suddenly it wasn't my album anymore. It was John and Beverly Martin. The sun's red and the sky was blue When I went rowing on the road to ruin I suppose I could be accused of commandeering, but it, was, it wasn't like that, really. It was, it was very much a, a joint affair. You know? I, I like to see it that way. I let him just take over, really. I, I didn't know how to deal with it, and he was quite a force to, to be reckoned with. Him. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against um, collaboration at all, but you're almost condescending to someone sometimes, you know? If, you, if you're playing with someone who doesn't really quite understand why you're playing and how you're playing, and you feel a touch strangled. When money's been spent on an album, you're supposed to then do what the record company says, which is, if they choose a single, great, then you promote it. I think we did two or three gigs to promote Stormbring and Road to Ruin, that was all. He started to play solo all the time. Ireland didn't want to continue um, with the duo. They wanted me, but they didn't want Beverly. And I had, by, by that time, I had um, my adopted child, Wesley, and also my Vary Dinks was on the way, so I had to make money. And uh, that was the only way I could do it, was, you know, do a solo career, go back to where I started almost, and do it, pursue the solo career. Kashmiri masala and yes, live curry paste. Yes. Uh, and or uh, preferably a banana. Curry paste, that'll do. Two teaspoons of each, is it? No, one teaspoon of kashmiri. Oh, yeah. One of each. <laughs> what he does is he buys the food, bosses you around and tells you how to cook it, and then goes off and leaves the whole thing to you from there on in and you're on your own. <laughs> I mean, wash up, i.e. That's so cruel. That's so true, though. So unfair! <laughs> yeah, I need to speak to me. Yeah. That's what the big professional chefs do, though, isn't it? Throw you can get worse, though. You can get worse yeah. than that. Throw tantrums. Hmm? It's tantrum throwing time. Oh, you get tantrums? Pass me something sharp. Hi, daughter sharp. A tongue sharper. I just. That's it. No more. Here. Sure. You want to be a girl, but it's wedgy on you. No, don't! Thank you. I had to. I need that. 
I couldn't resist it. Catch. <laughs> Catch. I'd rather be than you do. I just let them. Um, when I had to share almost everything. Uh, and my selfish self, I loved being free again. Oh, I can relax a bit now. God. Adoring millions. Make it down here, John. Make it down here, son. The music that I made was entirely different, I think, to what we'd done previously. It felt more personal to me. Acoustic or electric, what do you fancy? All right, done. <laughs> You see, I'm a terrific businessman, right? <laughs> the folk thing, you see, is you memorise the song, and you, this is the way it goes. The, first of all, you sing this verse, and then you sing, and then we have the instrumental, and then we sing this third verse, and then we maybe repeat the first verse. And it was all very cut and dried. Uh, I didn't like that, I never did, really. Although I was quite good at it. Uh, and I preferred the freedom that I was trying to get across in Blessed Weather, because things were not always the same, you know what I mean? At that point, I discovered the, the Echoplex and wobble, wobbled off into that direction. That was my hobby at home. Listening to Bomb was its um, debut. An Echoplex is a tape delay machine um, with a record head and a playback head, a movable head in between, thus giving you um, almost limitless um, tape delay. And it goes bonk, bonk, or bonk, bonk. And if one plays between the delays, then you can set up all kinds of rhythmic patterns, because you can have more than one bonk. <laughs> Part of the expression. It expands the guitar, things that you're doing on the guitar. It makes it so vast. John nailed it. That's his own sound. but definitely uh, induced that way, I would have thought, yeah. Nothing wrong with that. When I first started listening to John Martin, I was 17, I was at college, and um, I think I just started to uh, find the wonders of, of um, cannabis and I used to just adore solid air for example and just listen to it over and over and over and I would find myself literally with a starting you know with a jolt when his record would finish because it would just be a total journey I'd just be so taken away and transported and I, and I don't think it was just the weed I think it was definitely this this beautiful music I had never heard anything like it Solid Air is one of the first ambient records I ever heard. One of the things that happens for me when I listen to John's music is that it, it kind of stops the world. Um, and because I think he's so expressive in his voice, the tone of his voice, because he houses so much in the textures of his vocal delivery. It was after the first two records that he began that business of slurring his words, you know, alliding one word into the next, so it became almost poetic, like a cadence, you know, like a, a mellifluous cadence, if you like, just rolling, rolling along. I know you, I love you. When I took the mickey out of him once, I said, what's that song about you've been walking through sausages? Sausages, you know, it's classic song, you know, solid air. He will just sort of just go off on a vowel sound and if there are words to sing he'll maybe spin it out. You know, sweet doesn't come out as sweet, it comes out as sweet, sweet. And it's not because he's had too much to drink, it's just how it's sung. 
I think over the years it's got uh, less understandable, this singing, but he uses it more as an instrument rather than dictating the poem. Yeah, I suppose sometimes it wasn't always apparent, but, but it, would, it would become apparent and that's part of that discovery. It's like reading a poem over and over again and finally understanding it. Well, his music is, is like him, really, because uh, it can go from being very, very gentle, very folky, very acoustic guitarish, to being very wild and very, you know, so it's all recorded, you know, the two extremes of him. Don't look at me like that. Oh, you give you something bold, and I know you, every mob. First time I saw him playing live, he, he, he came on stage, sat down, barked into the microphone. And then carried on, and it's a fantastic gig. But but you, what you saw was what you got. Right, love song coming up. <laughs> He's full on, you know. So it's a kind of it's you wouldn't put the two together necessarily. I wouldn't, you know, no, listen to those, read those lyrics, and hear the, and then see John in a bar in Glasgow, kind of on one, and he can't possibly be the same person. May you never lose your temper. If you get in a barroom fighting, you never lose your one overnight. There's some big, deep, dark hurt in John somewhere, way back, I don't know where it is, or when it happened. I suspect it was there long before the music came to him. Well, it's like a hurt child, isn't it? You know, you, if you're really hurt, you can react so you can go all sort of sensitive and reclusive or you can punch your way out of it, you know. John does that all the time. And I just think, well, there's Ian McGee Ian McGeer here and John Martin. But there's a third one, there's a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> Hi guys. Why can't we all just get along? What is that? It's a Minerva, my dear. What is that? That's your Guinness. That's what I thought. Yeah. Anyway, I'm supposed I was supposed to walk around like this. Seriously, can you? I haven't even got it done up yet. Oh. And, and you do it up. You want to talk like that because you. Yeah, you know, Adam's out, I get squashed against the time. Anyway, so I thought perhaps. Excuse me. That's for your broken neck? Yes. Was it really? No, it's you. What? Oh, the neck accident? I was on holiday in you. Fucking June? Yeah. I guess I was no more with me at all. If it was going to top me, it would have topped me by now, I'm sure. Didn't you have a pancreas thing as well? Oh, yes. Oh, that one! <laughs> uh, that, I put that all down to a balanced diet. Uh, uh, it was a balance of pickled eggs, whiskey and beer. I did Solid Days, which did very well. Everyone loved it and thought, well, that's how oh, you've got him now. Inside out came a terrible shock to them. You know, he really did not like the idea that people kind of had branded him as being a folk artist. And he thought that the success of Me You Never, which a lot of people really liked that song, was partly responsible for it. So he was like, yeah, 
Stop following me a bit, get off, get off my shitter. You know, me you never out. For me it was just, I was actually just opening up, you know, I was becoming more intrigued by um, more high power music. You know, just a bit more high power. Wah pedals and squeaky noises and saxophones and drums and all that kind of stuff, you know. We've got uh, Wing Commander Danny the Snake Thompson on the contrabass here. From the minute I, I met him, I loved him. I wanted to be working with him and be, to make music. And it's a very special relationship. An extraordinary musical partnership, probably the best duo in terms of danger and edge of experimentation and unpredictability, madness, mayhem. Is it you? You told him. Oh, that told him. Right then. See, we're gonna have a fight now about who told me, right? Oh, I said, Nick. Oh, a happy band. Oh, a nice happy band. I do like a nice happy vibe on the stand. Oh, yes. You bollocks! Yeah, that fucking silly violin down the kick <laughs> And we've had fights, it's been great. We've had, we've had tremendous fights. An idea for a cover was for us to get in the ring. Thomas a Beckett Jim was, was booked through a friend of mine, uh, Neville Axford. So these two lunatics come in. We get quickly changed into our, our silks and laws that now it's for posing, right? For a cover. Posing. With Neville in the middle as a ref going, you know, classic. So I said, right John, just you know. And so he hits me. I said, John, why are you hitting me? Don't hit me. Just pose. So Neville says, yeah, come on, just Put your, he's trying to show him a classic boxing pose, which to him is this, you know. So, so he hits me again. I said, if you hit me again, I'm going to whack you. So of course, bang, and then it's all off, right? And his head's coming in, his knees coming up, you know. And it's, this is these boxers all around the gym looking at us like, and we're really fighting now. Who were our time? Yeah, that was our heyday, really. Yeah, was, we had a wonderful time. Yeah. <laughs> John was determined to out Danny Danny, and Danny wasn't going to have that, you know. We used to take on these unbelievable beverages. I mean, brandy and creme de menthe. I mean, we've had places swimming. I just love getting stoned all the time. Very high point. Oof. So much gear down here. Of everything, everything possible, really. Uh, I've always been something of a hedonist. Still am. Uh, the body won't take quite as much as it used to, but <laughs> there you go. Sadly, I have to uh, refute the rumours that I don't smoke dope. There have been rumours circulated that I don't. And it's actually bad for my reputation. And the very idea of JM with that spliff is anathema to my fans. And one could simply not consider life without ganja, man, you know. <laughs> this will sort your foot, man. Yes, I. Inhale gently and let the vapor of the herb come to my body, you see? And then me transfer it to my other toe. And me exhale and all the goodness, see? All the bad humor, them come up the right leg, them run down to the left and, and banish from me toe. <laughs> <laughs> I stand on me. 
People talk about John as a sort of folk singer. It leaves rock and roll. I don't know any rock and roll stories that compare with this, these you know, acoustic strummers and pickers. But I believe there were absolute nightmares with, you know, personality clashes and and substances and stuff like that getting in the way. But every now and then moments of absolute musical magic, you know. Stunning. <laughs> See, John, as I learned, is not at all a disciplined musician. You know, if there's an eight-bar sequence or a 12-bar or a four-bar, he would just make a change whenever he felt like making a change, a bit like John Lee Hooker's a bit like that, let's say. So you really needed a very intuitive, sort of jazz-orientated type musician who could work with him, who could, be, who could move very quickly when he moved. is with John, he swings. So you, you can be as clever as you, if you don't swing, forget it. Because if I said to John, play B flat major seven flat and nine, I might as well say, play the dinner plate. We're talking about natural. I can more or less play anything that I really want to play. I mean, someone who's sight reads is obviously going to get there quicker than you, but uh, <clears throat> it'll be straight. You know, it won't have, it won't have, it won't have, wouldn't have my edge. Uh, I don't like straight chords. Don't like. I never did. It's had a busy thing. You like broken and shattered, and you know, sort of somewhat tattered, torn at the edges. We never ever discussed his poetry, his songs, the music content. We just got together and did it. And he never said to me, do this, do that. Never, ever happened. We'd be in the pub, we'd get to the gig, we'd do the gig, and we'd be back in the pub all. You know. Three, four. Where's the money? <laughs> <laughs> Well, wow, that was John Martin. <laughs> the way is too short. Right. right. Just take the weight off the first repeat. As far as I'm concerned, but it it allows you a certain degree of um, freedom. In, 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 in action. So it's not any no wine, no women, no song? Oh no, far from it. Heaven for a friend about it. <laughs> they had the slightest thing to do with anything like that. <laughs> no form of asceticism whatsoever, thank you. But I think I'll drink today. <laughs> Here's to asceticism. Of course, quite a different asceticism. <laughs> I mean, here's your bit of money. <laughs> so does your Buddhism help you cope with your foot? Um, the acceptance is inevitable as part of it. I mean, it's, it's a bit like um, nurturing the attitude of having no fear. And when you kind of run past that, you, just have, you don't have any, you know I mean? I mean? When I was wild and young, I used to walk, I mean, quite deliberately walk around. Where's the biggest geezer in the place? You know, I mean, hit him. Just for fun. Now, I knew it was the wrong thing to do. Um, but uh, I've stopped all that. And it was the Buddhism what did uh, teach me that it was the wrong thing to do. Daddy, will you sing for me? Daddy, try and sing for me. Daddy, please sing for me. Like a fist, and I'm 
Our personal relationships away from each other go through stormy things. So we had our own individual, you know, not problems, but getting on with life, you know, and our relationships with uh, our loved ones or wives and girlfriends or whatever. Playing together was a release for a lot of things. It was a bit of a tricky time because I was working so much and spending so much time away from home that I was losing touch with the other kids and stuff. He had a life of his own, which I didn't really know about, because he was always on the move, moving constantly, working constantly, you know, gregarious, always, you know, meeting people. I, I had a child, I had to stay indoor. I stayed in, indoors, really, and that was it. John has brought his life into his work you know, his love songs. They kind of admit to personal failures at times. I've spoken to other people, you know, sensitive souls that don't just go to see him cutting up rough or wobbling about, but like go to see him really work and hear that that cry from the soul. Howling wolf. I mean, wolves only howl for a reason. <laughs> Men only cry for a reason. Men do cry as well, you know. Um, and that's, you know, I think it's the same thing. It's a sadness, an intrinsic sadness in, 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 in any creature, which uh, is part of music's real attraction for me. Doesn't matter if you're a great artist or uh, play the blues and make everybody cry. It's what you do as a human being that counts at the end of the day. I think when he, he was sober, he was wanting to get drunk, basically. He was Jekyll and Hyde. He, he could turn on a sixpence, you know. He, he, he would just turn, you know. There was no little nice boy left anymore, you know, smiling and innocent. At that time, my brother was managing and he was kind of in the middle of a lot of domestics that were fucking awful, actually. I mean, things I heard. Um, at the same time, however, he recorded Small Hours. Just him with a complex guitar and it was recorded at um, about three o'clock in the morning and it's on a lake. And there's a the, the sort of main railroad line and the difference which goes from London to Bristol. And on the lake there are all these uh, these geese and you you hear that atmosphere at night. something which was kind of slow and then the chords were just hanging there for ages and you know you'd get all these ambient sounds I'd really love that track and if that doesn't move you there's something you're not a lot there's something wrong with you it's absolutely exquisite 
a hymn to the night or something in reflective, dark, strange, experimental. It's absolutely beautiful. Get on up and fly away. Move on now for another way. New days dawn. Gonna carry on. Keep on loving while your love is strong. Keep on loving till your love is gone. Well, you're very, very lovely, gonna take you home Say you'll be my ruin, but I just don't care Cause I love you so Just love you so And keep on loving till your love is gone Keep on loving while your love is strong Um, I think I should watch a clear rain, I don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Dear Auntie, things keep happening to me. I don't know why. But this last year has been murder. Uninvited cattle. Divided nerves. Deranged doctors. Ah, Claire. Yours. In hopes that you can help, John Martin, Esquire. I can't reach the fucking phone. Hello. Uh, the music is coming along nicely. Um, as soon as I have finished the album, which I trust will be in the next four days, then I call the guys. I was going to say, book me the operation. I'm coming, take my fucking leg off. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know what it's like. I think, man, to be honest, I can't go on like this. It's like, been a year. I've been, I've been, I've done fuck all. Yeah, I, I, no question, man. No question. Man, I'm another pile of shit. I was going through a divorce, and he was going through the divorce with Beverly. And uh, we used to he used to stay at my house, and we'd stay up all night, drinking and playing and recording. And um, we got very close. I'd moved out of the master bedroom of my house and put this little studio in, eight track studio. And there was a phone on the floor, and basically we took it in turns to sort of call our relative, you know, <laughs> partners. And there'd be all kinds of shouting matches going on. And he put the phone down, and then I'd go on and try and get through to my ex, and then she put the phone down. Yeah, yeah, there'd be phone calls left, right, so I've got to go now. And say, oh, I forgot making a phone call. It's awful. It's dreadful. So the vast amounts of cheap wine was drunk. It was good that we had it. I think we went through it together. Because it was pretty miserable for me, I remember that, and I think he was, he was pretty miserable as well. So, but you know, it was certainly. Up, I mean, that whole thing was became very creative for me because you know, face value came out of that. It was cathartic and painful at the time, but in general, it was kind of cleansing, cleansing. I think One World was the album directly before Grace and Danger. That was a big criti critical success and he was kind of riding on a certain crest of a wave and you know I think people kind of felt this next record, if it's the right record, could push him over into a commercial success. And then they got this quite sad album.
brother when he was managing, he actually said to him, you're all grace and danger, John, and it actually became the title of the album that they were doing. And I think it's a very good summing up of John. You're probably right. Uh, I think my whole life has been a sort of uh, a balance between those two. Parted, and uh, he decided to go with his band, which I thought, uh, I said, what do you want a second rate soul band? That's just so he can do all that macho thing, you know. Swan about with his extra guitar, he walking up and down. What is all that? You know, I don't get it. But he persevered, and I, I've been to gigs, and it's fantastic. And he's, you know, he's made another successful part of his life, you know, with the with the band. I see a door play with the band. Um, when you want to say something, you can say it with so much more uh, authority. You can really, you know, it's like, I'm sad now. Can't you hear me? Can't, these lads understand. Listen to them. They're playing sadly. I'm sad too. Are you sad? And then it's like, I'm angry now. Are you angry? Yeah. I mean, so it's different. You, get, you, you can... <sighs> you can give the audience a broader picture of emotion from which to draw. So have you got a plan now for your um, right. album? Oh, it's done. Finished. Um, I don't really give a fuck. I'm not the truth of the matter. I really don't, you know. What, you don't care about the album? Or? I don't care about anything, really. All I would care about is getting better. I mean, once I'd done, I, I, I care about getting back on the road. I'm mad for that. Yeah. What was the hospital like? Is that right? Oh, it was as good as any hospital can be, I suppose. With your morphine. Yeah. Oh, the morphine was wonderful. So, is it? Are you? Are you in pain, or is it better? Is it oh no, the pain is more or less gone. It's getting, actually, I always thought the phantom pain. I still think my foot's there at times. It's going to get a terrible, you know, a terrible pain in my heel on my toes or something. It's the toes that really do. And then you suddenly realise I'm not fucking there, so it can't be so. But it is. Very funny. Oh, yeah. he. So do you find do you find yourself trying to wiggle? Yeah. Oh yes, definitely. Yeah. I, I try to find myself trying. You know how one keeps one's shoes off. I keep trying. <laughs> I keep trying to keep it there. <laughs> and now again, I just actually forget about the whole caper. Get up out of bed. If I'm half asleep, for instance. No, I think it's gone. You know? <laughs> Fall over. <laughs> so was it was it like a success straight away? Or was... No, no. They buggered about. Well, they didn't bugger about. That's not, that's not true. They. Um, you buggered about. No, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, there was a, a blood vessel that didn't, that didn't, didn't fancy life with me, with me or whatever it was. Didn't, didn't like its state, and it popped. I mean, I was supposed to be in there for seven to ten days, and it ended up a lot longer than that. Oh God, I didn't realise you only went to be in hospital that ten days. Yeah, no, seven to ten days. That's what they said. You know, that was That's... an enticement to come in. <laughs> That's what they could torture me for seven weeks. <laughs> I'll just sit and cross my legs, shall I? It's gonna do no harm. You both have a little old shot in the arm, and it's all round my veins. Oh, cookie. Oh, Faster, faster, dog. Don't tell me again and again. You say cookie's forces. Exactly. On you. Oh. Sure running round my brain. You know the doctor <laughs> tell me, tell me again, yeah, help. again. He said, cocaine no. kill you, son, it won't say when. Cocaine sure yeah, running around my brain. Off the diving board. I'm going, I'm going. It's oh. a story about cocaine, Lil. She had a cocaine house on. I'm ready for this. I'll take it anymore. Cocaine ball. dog and cocaine cat. She even had a oh, cocaine dear. Oh, dear. A miserable day. Around my brain.
I mean, my definition of a great artist is someone who really does what they feel inside and it comes from them. I mean, so many artists now, it's just like, I call it musical toupees, you know, they put on the, and, and it's, it's pathetic, isn't it? It's a pathetic sight. Yes, much here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons that I've been so successful, in fact, Scots in general are so successful abroad, is because of that innate sense of diplomacy. I will not be told what to do. I can't do it in, a, in any shape or form. Above all, if you can't play what you want to play, then where on earth is your freedom? You're actually making music, which is supposed to be an expression of yourself, an expression of what somebody else wants to hear. You know, it's very important that that's, that's very important. It's part of yourself, it's part of, your, it's part of your pride, it's part of your, your integrity, it's part of your self-esteem. If you lose that, you've lost everything, I think. His manager at the time, Sandy Robertson, I was, I was thinking was, you know, he wanted him to be as successful as he could be, you know. He always wanted a single. He never got one, of course, but I mean, I'm not a singles maker. So I have no love for service Sandy Roberts. He ended up hating me, quite right, I broke his ribs. I don't fuck about too much. It's insane. Of course John's got a distrust for the business. Same as I have. So he ends up getting, you know, people like second-hand dustbin salesman to look after his business that are very, very, very good with handling money. <laughs> if you like, he's his own worst enemy, but at the same time, he's his best ally because it keeps him free of all that crap, you know? He will not sell out. He can't. He can't sell out. That's the great thing about it because when he starts to sell out, he just gets bored and pisses people every one of the record company. You know, he, he was difficult more because he was a bit erratic. He wasn't, he wasn't just difficult for the sake of being bloody-minded or something. He was, I, I don't ever remember him being like that. And what comes out of John comes out of John. It doesn't come out of a bottle. You know, all that knowledge, all that spirit. I think what comes out of the bottle is aggression and that feeds him. He's an aggressive man. A lot of people, you know, love John but hate him as well. They will, can't stand him, they won't have him around because he's been so out of order. He's larger than life, you know, this I am John Wayne, you know. Clumsy piece of shit you ever saw in a fucking natural pub. Not worth a candle. Now then, this is the tricky bit. Oh, I fall over, pick me up. Mm, Just take glasses. Cool. Fucking thing. She got me. Hey, my head fell off. You used to, if John Martin was playing at, you know, Oxford Union or, or Leeds University or wherever, it would be full because people would go there to hear this 30 year, 35 year history of music. And, um, 
and they were going to get something that wasn't going to be like last night and it wouldn't be like tomorrow night, it would be like that. You know, and he may be a little bit drunk and he may be a little bit out, but it's going to be, it was like a jazz concert. Audiences love that. They love people who are real because they're never quite sure what they're going to get because the artist himself is not quite sure what he's going to give. He likes the cutting edge, I think he likes the unknown. He wants to move on and try something different, to keep it interesting for himself. Because that's also is what feeds an artist, and getting it right all the time is less important than actually having a go. It's been what? 18 months since it's been out live? Yeah. You know, it's just like anything. Yeah, yeah. You, you. Well, John actually had, had thought, I'll do a tiny gig in the quietest little place possible as my, you know, re initiation back to live. Yeah. Now, apparently, it's all, all hell's let loose. John's kind of, he's quite nervous. He didn't, he, I don't think he wanted to sing. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, he just wanted to, right, I'm there, I've done it, yeah, that's my guitar, so I'm right, I want to go. That's an important one, this one. Yeah. yeah. We've got to get over this gig, obviously. Pure logistics, and that he's never addressed changing instruments. He's got all of the psychological baggage that comes with okay. needing somebody to wheel him on stage. Come on, Johnny! If I find that I'm really rotten at it and the voice is gone or some fucking thing's gone, coordination is gone, so I'm not feeling good with it, I will leave quietly and think of something else. Uh, I make pop records. You know. <laughs> make third grade music is what I'll do. I'll just drop myself down a couple of notches, you know what I mean? Make bad music for money. I don't want to know about evil. I only want to know about love. I don't want to know first thing about evil. I only want to know about love. Sometimes it gets so hard to listen.